Hey, this is Mike, and uh, you're watching the uh, Real Black Podcast in conversation. Now, this is one I've been trying to get, been trying to land this Joker for decades. Stop it! I've man. made movies about your other two brothers yes. in show business. No, the the, the documentary you did on, is it was a documentary or was it a? I've done two. Yeah, oh, the documentary on Jordan was very very good. Thank you. Yeah, very good. I was I, I was impressed with that one. Thank the you. one you did on Chris was so long ago. It was like it's almost like you kind of captured. Something before it blew, yeah. Like you was you interviewed the dynamite before it exploded because his the documentary you did on Chrissy we call Chris Chrissy by the way the documentary you did on Chrissy he was really like right at that he was still living at home yeah he was like didn't even move out yet didn't even have the red Corvette yet didn't, it wasn't no SNL no it was like you caught it nineteen eighty nine you caught it right before it took off wow okay so that was super and I caught you. You always tell that story. Yes, man. You caught me. Is that, is that <laughs> the, the moment? Well, what, uh, so I'm, it's been so, so with us today, Tony Rock. Yes, yes, yes. Friend um, of the Rock family, Mike Dennis. So thank you. I appreciate that. Um, but yeah, you always tell the story how we came over and interviewed you or something. So I, I, need, I need that so we can show the tape. You think of your brother's success? Yeah. I think you go see his movies. Yeah. I, the first movie, uh, Cop 2. I didn't see it till we got the videotape. But uh, I'm going to get you sucker. I saw that the week it came out. Like. And now I see this car out here. I'm really, I'm proud of him, for real. Serious. What, do you want to follow his footsteps? Who, is he the funniest person in the family? <laughs> no, no. I'm the funniest person in the family. Easy. Prove it. <laughs> no, that's all right. Okay, let me see. No, that's all right. <laughs> What, is he funny in Chris? Who? Is Andy? Really? No. He is. So we, you came to Bedford Stuyvesant in Brooklyn, and you came to the real bed -Stuy. You came to, I think we, went, we, did a, we took a tour of the neighborhood to see where we grew up and how we were growing up. You got your good and you got your bad. Some areas is good and some areas are bad. But, um... Mostly blacks that in this neighborhood mostly go to a predominantly black school. So, yeah. We have Sar uh, Saratoga Avenue. Hey, Sarah. 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 Hey,
you kind of got to just stick to your set because you can't really engage the room because the guy in the front row, the guy that's 90 rows back can't see what's going on. So right. it kind of takes the back of the room out of the show if you try to right. do crowd work or be, you know, casual. So I, I, I like that in the, in the size of it, mm -hmm. you know, and the energy and the roar of 15,000 and the, the wave of a laugh going to the back and coming back. I like that. But then I like stuff like this because I get to cultivate the material and really see what they think about it. I get to say it, write a joke, say mm -hmm. it, and see what this guy right here okay. thinks about it, you know, on his face. Right. So what this, this table's laughing and these girls are, oh, shit, that's true. So I, I like to see right. what the process in their minds is, and I take the joke. Yeah, and you're, and you're always painting pictures. Absolutely, yeah. That, that seems to be the hallmark of yeah. every joke you tell. Yeah. You, you create something in our imagination. Uh, Wanda, Wanda Sykes, one of my mentors, told me, uh, you know, anybody can take brown and green and make a tree, but the real artist takes the brown and then the lighter shade of brown and then the green and puts the yellow around it to show you that the leaves are turning and it's fall and puts the mm -hmm. black hole to show that there's a woodpecker there and then puts acorns on the ground and puts a few squirrels there. So she, you paint more vivid picture, they see more of the joke. Can, can you all see this audience, folks watching on YouTube? <laughs> um, well, I mean, you know, you're a master of your craft. That's all I, I can try, say. I try. I try. Thank you, you sir. Know, I've never been to a Tony Rock show and not felt the energy that you put. Oh, thank you, man. Yeah. So, but, um, you know, so what, what, what are we, well, before we get into what, what's going on now, there's a lot of things topical. This may, it's been years since we had a chance to talk down, talk, uh, talk about your career. So, when did you know you wanted to tell jokes? Because when, when we first met, you were the funny guy, but you weren't. I was, yeah, I was neighborhood funny when we met. Uh -huh. When we met, I was stoop funny. I was the guy that would just come outside, sit on the stoop, and roast everybody that walked past. Okay. And everybody on the block knew that the Rock Brothers would sit outside and, you know, we called it ranking. Some people call it snapping. Some people call it jonesing. Playing a dozen. Well, dozens. Yeah. Or we call it ranking. Mm -hmm. So they knew, like, the Rock Brothers are going to come outside on a Saturday afternoon and just rank anybody that walks past the yard out. Mm -hmm. And it kind of turned into a thing. Like, people would come on a Saturday, like, once they saw us sitting on the stoop, they knew it was a show. And I was the neighborhood funny guy. I was the guy that would just tear people up. Your mamas and this and Your mama so fat, your father so this, you did right. all that, and what you had on. And I was that guy. Then I was, I kind of, you know, got into sports and would play basketball in the neighborhood. And after a game, I would sit there on the court and snap on guys and mm -hmm. sit along the fence and rank on whoever. And I was known as the funny guy in the neighborhood, but I wasn't. I didn't have professional aspirations at the time. So what, what made it change? What was your aha moment? What was your first time on stage? The what? aha moment, uh, the aha moment was, it was it's kind of like a process. The aha moment is, you know, listening to Richard Pryor albums and thinking this guy is incredibly funny and maybe I can do this, you know. Mm -hmm. Then there's the aha moment when the guy in the next room starts doing stand-up and you say, okay, maybe it's not so far-fetched that, I didn't know Richard Pryor, I didn't know Eddie Murphy, I didn't know George Carlin, so they were ideals to me. Mm -hmm. But when the guy in the next room is doing stand-up, it's like, okay, now it's real. Mm. Because this guy's doing it, and I know this guy. I talk to him every day, so if he can do it, I can do it. Right. So I wouldn't say my brother you know, made me do stand-up or was the reason why, but he made the dream real. The, I had the dream before him, but then when he started, it was like, okay, I can do this. Right, and wh where? what was your first time on stage? First time ever on stage was, uh, I believe, the comic strip, 82nd and 2nd, open mic night, went up, had a pretty good set. Lucian Hole, the manager at the time. Rest in peace. Told, rest, may he rest in peace. Uh, told me uh, he could tell that it was my first time on stage, but he liked that I had some material that said something, uh -huh. and he said, you know, give it some time and come back again and see us. All right, so paint, paint the picture. Flat top? Then, uh, flat top, uh, chip tooth. Uh, skinnier than I am now, really? nervous like a motherfucker, uh -huh. uh, looking at the floor. I couldn't even look up at the room, uh, hold, holding the mic stand the entire time because I was, couldn't let go. I, you know, if I let go of the mic stand, you feel like you're kind of out there, so you kind of hold the mic stand and look down to keep your, keep your sanity, I guess. You know? mm -hmm. So very, very nervous, very green green, green. green, man, green. But Lucian, having been in the business so long, knew something there in his material he, he's mm -hmm. trying to say something i see what he's trying to do so and you know i'm talking to jordan i know that it's extra harder actually yes to to break yes. through because you have to find your own lane yes jordan rocks my favorite comedian in the entire world by the way i like to add that okay shout out to jordan <laughs> um yeah so what, how how long did it take for you to yeah so then after voice? lucian said that i uh uh, I didn't go on stage for a while, like maybe eight months. I just wow. thought, oh, man, this is, I don't know. If I'm going to get critiqued, and I, I thought I knew what I was doing, and he's critiquing me. I kind of, 
And then I went on stage one night in Harlem. Mm. Uh, it's Harlem Week. Remember Harlem Week? They no, used to, Harlem no, Week Uptown is... Comedy Club, I remember. Yeah, on, on, when it was on 125th. Uh-huh. So Harlem Week is a week-long block party in Harlem. Uh-huh. The entire week, is the streets are closed. There's arts and crafts and stuff. They, everybody okay. sells on the streets. It's like, mm-hmm. you know, a, it's, it's, it used to be really big back in the day. All the bootleg Before t-shirts. Harlem got gentrified. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're walking, me and like nine of my boys in Harlem, walking around, having a good time. And we walk past Uptown Comedy Club. And it's a guy outside barking. Barking is when you try to solicit an audience from the people that walk mm-hmm. past. Like, hey, comedy show starting in 10 minutes. Come inside, get your tickets. I had eight friends with me. My eight friends said, hey, we'll all pay to come inside and watch the show if you let him go on. Wow. Okay. And the guy's like, I'm going to get eight people to pay to come inside. Hell yeah, we'll put your friend on. Now, I thought I'm funny with my friends. I'll be funny on stage the same uh-huh. way. No written material. Just I'll go up and do right. what I do with my friends. Not good. Not in Harlem, Not no. good. The people that don't know you don't know you. Now, were you using your real name at this point? I I'd was be Tony afraid. Rock. I went up. I was Tony Rock. Oh, and goodness. I was like snapping on people in the front row. And, you know, a guy and his girl. I'm like, oh, look at this couple. They look like. And the dude's like, yo, shut the fuck wow. up, man. Yo, you don't know me. And then people in the back are booing. And I'd say I lasted about 20 seconds. So you were up against what? Maceo? Maceo. Uh. Uh, this guy, singers, dancers, rappers. It's, it's, it's like Kevin. Wait, there's a guy. The Apollo Comedy Hour. The whole cast. Uh, there was a guy that actually did um, the whole Shanene character. Before, Derek Fox. He did Shanene before. Isn't Martin that, Lawrence. that the guy who Martin took Shanene from? I, I believe. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Derek yeah. needs money, folks. Uh, yeah. So I bombed. I got booed off stage, and then it was Harlem week, so every all the shops were outside in the street. So people uh-huh. were still outside for hours and hours <laughs> after this. So we leave. And people are walking past an hour later, like, yo, that's the dude right there that got booed up stage. And then people are, I'm oh, going to get God. a hot dog. It's like, yo, this is the dude right here. He sucked. So the whole rest of the night, I got booed. They're coming over right there. What, what? But you know what it was? The walk. I tell people this all the time. The walk from the back of the room to the stage was the most excited I had been about damn near anything in my life. And I knew I had to get back on stage. What, what were your options uh, at that time? What were you doing? Go to work and, you know. So you're just working? I was just working a regular job. Yeah. Where were you? I, was, I, was, I was Clark Kent before I realized I was Superman. What, what jobs did you have? Oh, everything. I worked at McDonald's. I worked, uh, I worked in, I was a catering manager at Auburn Payne. I was, uh, I worked in stock. I worked at a, a, a clothing store one time that was, uh, I worked stock at the clothing store. Then the clothing store was going out of business. So they transferred all the stock people to L- New Jersey to be in the warehouse to pack up everything because the store was going out of business right. and load 18 wheelers all day. We just mm-hmm. loaded 18 wheelers all day wow. to get all of the surplus. This is a battle life. What time did you get up today, this morning? Today, I woke up at the crack of noon <laughs> to see the Steelers play the Ravens. I woke up the young lady that slept with me last night. I asked her her name again, and I uh, treated her to breakfast before she left. So a l- little bit better than stocking uh, 18 wheelers, <laughs> folks. If you think you have any glimpse of, of uh, humor or sense of it, like live your dream, I think is the message. Yes, live your dream. Try, live the dream yourself. dies when you die. So, Unless it's going to the NFL, because when you're 50, that dream's over. So just keep at it. That's yeah, just keep saying. at it. Keep at it. Keep at it. Believe and keep at it. Believe. Okay, well, I'm so proud of you. Um, you know, but, but what, what strikes me is that you, you guys, I mean, be, I think your brothers keep you, your other brothers keep you grounded. Absolutely. But, Absolutely. Those are my guys, man. Uh, you know, just how, but you also are like, uh, you got a PhD in race and racism, Race relations. I mean, you just have a very insightful uh, perception of. Ah, uh, yeah. My, my my childhood is is kind of unique in that regard. How do you say that? I don't know. Because uh, we went to a, my my mother, being the school teacher that she was, wanted her children to get a better education, so she agreed to have us bust from Bedford Stuyvesant, Brooklyn, to Garrettson Beach, Brooklyn. Very many people, very few people, have heard of Garrettson Beach, Brooklyn. It is whiter than uh, than Bensonhurst. It is whiter than uh, the whitest part of Brooklyn. It's the, it's the, it is the creme de la creme of the white part of Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. So we were bus there, hour and a half bus ride every morning to school. We were one of the Rock Brothers were one. What we were like a group of maybe twenty black kids in the whole school. Mm-hmm. Four of them were Rock Brothers. Uh, it bonded us immediately because every day at three o'clock. Uh, a teacher would walk through the halls and scream, outer district, outer district, and all the kids that lived outside of the district had to line up to get on the school bus. Mm-hmm. So when we lined up at 3 o'clock, we were sitting ducks mm-hmm. for all the white kids that lived in the neighborhood. So at 3 o'clock, all of the kids, that, we would line up right here on the sidewalk, 
And then all the kids that lived in the neighborhood would walk across the street to their friends who didn't go to the school that lived with them. And the kids that we were in school with the whole day that we thought was cool and friends, once they got across the street, it was get the niggas, stinking niggas, throwing rocks at us, throwing batteries at us. Wow. And we're like, yo, we just, we was just in class with this kid. And it taught me how people will follow the masses, regardless of if they're right or wrong. Mm-hmm. I would sit next to a kid all day in class, and it would be cool. And then once he got across the street to his friends, and the group was bigger than our group, he believed what they believed. He didn't. He wasn't like that in class. Right. So it taught me how people just follow. Most people are followers. Most people really don't stand on what they believe in. They'll just follow the masses. That's, that's the toughest thing for me to deal with in social media. Because some, sometimes I think, you know, we're, I'm, I'm trying to empower people, encourage them. But it's just every kind of, everybody kind of gravitates to their own right. comfort right. level. Yeah. And and social, social media will show you that. In, just in, the, in, in social media, uh, we all taught to be independent thinkers and have your mm-hmm. own, you know, freedom of, of, of opinion and all that stuff unless you go against the masses. Hmm. So everybody's supposed to be, you know, you, you have your in, own independent thought, but if you go against the masses, you a hater, you don't like, you dummy, you don't, it's like, what happened to being free thinking? Like, you know? Well, that, that automatically brings up the whole Kanye situation in the verge of this thing. Are you, do you have any take on? Well, Kanye's we, interesting because I always believe that when people lose a parent, they lose themselves. Mm-hmm. And Kanye didn't have a dad to grow up with. I don't know if he, what his relationship with his dad is, but I never saw him in videos. I never saw him yeah, heard him rap about well, his dad. He just re- reconciled with him. Right, so from what I knew... Helping, it, helping his father, health care primarily. Right, but from what we knew, it was just him and his mom. Yeah. And once um, he lost his mom, he lost himself. Mm-hmm. It's like a lot of... Look at 50 Cent. 50 Cent, no parents. This guy will start beef with anybody to drop up a hat. Because mm-hmm. when you don't have parents to just reel you in sometimes, you just don't care. You have no filter. You don't, you don't care about, you know... Mm-hmm. Just a respect level of going there because you just yeah well, you, you don't care. Well, I mean, well, I mean, I, I, I haven't been following your social media lately. I know sometimes oh, I'm just go, stunting on these hoes. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you just but some, sometimes I'm living the dream, man. Well, God bless you. God, God bless you and these United States for, allow, <laughs> for allowing us this, this uh, would be broke flat tap having <laughs> truck delivery boy. Oh yeah, I used to I used to work for the Daily News, New York Daily News, throwing papers off well, the truck. That's some more nepotism, Jesus! Yeah. All right, yeah. I didn't know but, that. Yes, one. my dad got me that job. Yes. Well, good to have family in in, in whatever job. Yes. It's good to have somebody vouch for you. So, um, but you know the other the other thing, there's a lot of on social media. I see a lot of stuff. There's like Cardi B and Nicki going at it, and then Cat Williams going after everybody. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, have you been? In, what, what's your take on any of this beef? Does it make any sense? When was the last time? you No, got it, it doesn't beef? make any sense. It really doesn't. It, it it makes sense in this regard that black people seem to think that there's only one spot for one black person. Hmm. So Nicki's hot, Cardi gets hot. Nicki feels a certain way because she thinks there's only one slot for her. And if, uh, if somebody else is hot, it's going to take away from me. Mm. A candle loses nothing by lighting another candle. A candle don't go out because it lights another candle. That's just two candles lit. You hear that, Cat? Well, Cat, Cat go, I think Cat felt he had that number one spot, too. So. He can, everybody, everybody can have a number one spot. I, I mean, Kev's in the number one spot in Kev's lane. Cat's mm-hmm. in the number one spot in Cat's lane. Mike is in the number one spot in his mm-hmm. lane. I'm in the number one spot in my lane. Just be concerned with your lane. Everything okay. happens for you in your time. It's all God's will, and when you get it, it's for you. Okay. You're not going to get nothing for you that's not for you. Mm-hmm. And by somebody else getting something doesn't mean they took from you. It means it was theirs. You get yours. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, so I think – I don't even remember what the beef was. I think you inadvertently had said something in some random interview. Who's that got, No, you got into some trouble on social media the last time I saw you, but I don't even remember what, what the well, issue I don't, was. I didn't was get in trouble in social media because I stand by anything I say in social media. But you had so. said something and then it, got, it blew up, about the, the viral thing. Was, oh, Steve Harvey, that's what it was. No, the Steve Harvey thing was, was crazy. This is what happened. I, and I, I've, said, I've been over this before, and yeah. Steve and I have spoke since then. Okay. So it was all good. But I was doing an interview. I was promoting uh, the game of dating, the, the TV mm-hmm. show I had on TV One. Right. And the TV One publicist brought me in to do interviews and... Behind the camera, what people couldn't see was a bunch of TV One execs. Mm-hmm. So I'm rambling on, I'm talking, and the interview's over, but the camera's still okay. rolling. Mm-hmm. And the girl says, uh, so you, you know, you, you're hosting a dating game, maybe you write, next you'll write a dating book. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know about all that. And she's like, yeah, you'll be the next Steve Harvey. And I'm like, yeah, well, why did he write a book? Like, Steve Harvey's not the, right. the, the guy that should be writing. And I just start talking, and the right. TV One execs are behind the camera dying right. laughing. Uh-huh. So as a comic, when you see people laughing, you keep going. Right. 
So I just kept rambling on, camera rolling. Maybe the publisher should have said, you know what, we shouldn't air this part. Cut that out, you know, mm-hmm. because we're trying to promote the show. But they took the Jesus thing. They took thing. it and she cut it and only aired that part. Wow. And the next day, I didn't even know it was out. The next day, people are calling me like, damn, yo, you said you, was, you went in. And I'm not going to backtrack over anything I say. I, I say it, right. I said it. Well, it's, so, it's weird. So you experienced it. That leads into the, the next last thing I want to talk about. So at being a public figure, it's not like everybody's a public figure. And I know you, I don't right. want you to, to spoil your act. You, you talk about some of the people that uh, bust people while they're being black. But there, it just seems like um, people losing their jobs over nonsense that happens on the Internet. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, the, camera, the, the, the camera phone has changed the game. Mm-hmm. Is, is the camera phone is, that's an, I always say that like I grew up in the best era just because of how the, the younger kids act now. Like my era was really, you stood on what you believed in and we would fight hand to hand and nobody got shot. And if you got beat up, you just got beat up and the next day was another day. You was, at least you was alive. Now it's all just shooting. Now it's all just, uh, you know, if you get beat up, it's recorded. It's on World Star. Right. So you're going to live, live that over and over again. It's going to get a million views. If you right. got beat up 10 years ago, it's like, hey, you just get up and dust yourself off. Nobody saw it. You look around. Okay, good. Right. Yeah, if, if, I mean, if there's any dirt on me from back in the day, they have to pull out a VHS tape and <laughs> find a, a player yeah, yeah, to, yeah. to pull it out. But social know? media has changed very many things. Yeah, so, I mean, not, you know, I don't want you to spoil your act, but um, specifically. Oh, what am I talking about? Uh, white people calling the cops on black people? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's insane. You know what, it, know what I think a part of this comes from? And I was telling, uh, I think I was telling Skeet yesterday. A part of it is the gentrification. Mm-hmm. Now that we're all living in one neighborhood, yeah. white people don't understand how we live when we're at home. Mm-hmm. So we go nine to five uh, interacting together. But then at five o'clock, they would go to the suburbs and we would go to the hood. And we didn't know how each other lived. Right. So now we're all in one neighborhood and they're like, oh, they opened the fire hydrant. Why are they jumping around in the fire hydrant? This is what the fuck we've been doing for 20 years. Now that y'all are here, this is some criminal shit. Right. But we've been doing this. this so now they call them the cops because they haven't been doing it. So now it's just because two different types of people are trying to live in one neighborhood that they're like, they haven't experienced how we live. Well, well true, but also the social conditioning of media. And the, watching the news and, and just seeing a big black person, they're automatically... Again, born suspect. Right, right. No, but it's, it's, it's gentrification. It's the social media. And it's also Trump has put the battery in the back of white people. Mm-hmm. It's cool to be, like, aggressive towards black people now. It's like, okay. you don't think they should be, should be around you? Yeah, they shouldn't be around you. Show them. I mean, we've, seen, we've seen videos. Uh, i seen a video one. It was a girl in a, in a supermarket. And she was on the phone with one of her friends saying, uh, hey, I'm at, you know, Walmart. Do you have any more... Uh, food stamps because I'm I got like thirty dollars left, bring me some food stamps. Mm-hmm. And the lady behind her online is like starts recording, like, mm-hmm. are you trading food stamps? That's illegal. Yeah, Trump's gonna get you guys. And, and the mm-hmm. black girl's like, bitch, mind your business. What are, what mm-hmm. the fuck are you talking about? But that's what it, they don't in, right. understand the interaction. Different two languages, two Americas. Yeah. So, so. He put the battery in their back. Yeah, I mean, but you but so but you grew up ahead of that. You saw you saw all this firsthand before yeah, the so cameras. What I was saying about going to the public school, I went to all white public school and we got in fights every day. We got in, uh, uh, people don't like, my mother's always like, don't say that because people are not going to believe it. Every day, mm-hmm. Monday to Friday, from first grade to sixth grade, I got in a fight at three o'clock. Mm-hmm. Every day at three o'clock, it was get the niggas. And my father's rule was if one of your brothers is in a fight, you in a fight. So they might not be after me this day, they might be after Brian. We mm-hmm. all jumping in. They after Andre, we all jumping in. They after Chrissy, we all jumping in. So we got in a fight every day. So then I graduate sixth grade, all white school, and my mother's like, okay, that was a little traumatizing. So now you guys can go to school in the neighborhood. Mm-hmm. So now you, I'm a two minute walk to my junior high school. Okay. Two minutes, like out the door, right up the block. I'm thinking this is going to be great. Now I get there, I read better. Mm. I talk l- a little proper. I come in in the morning, first day of school, seventh grade, and I say, good morning, teacher. And they're like, who the fuck is this dude? Mm-hmm. Yeah, what's wrong with this dude? And I'm like, good afternoon to the girls. And they're like, what's wrong with you? And they asked me to read, and I stand up and read. And they're like, what's wrong with this dude? So right. I didn't fit in with my own people because right. of the six years I So spent. it was beyond code switching. It was yeah. literally, you, you were a rock brother at that point. But the thing that, the, my through line in life has always been, I was a great athlete, and I was funny. So after a couple of months, it was like, you know what? This rock dude's cool, man. Rock's okay. cool. He's funny, and he plays ball, and girls seem to like him. So now they, the hood embraced me. Okay, so we'll do race, and then relationships, and then we're out. Okay. So, in ter- so where are we 2018? I mean, I, I feel like you, you have a PhD in race relations. We are all, we are the world, people. 
all remember that. I don't know if that record's gonna come back. I think every they copy should of that record, remake it. Yeah, that every dope. copy of that record is in some used record store they now. People remake forgot We All the World. But where are we now? 2018. Every the the lid's been off, lifted off the garbage can of America. Right. And you get to tour the whole country and just bring people together. What what do you think is are we? Are we spiraling out of control where youth, young people well, are afraid, uh, we, we have old to... people are afraid, everybody's afraid because they, they want Soul Train to come back on. <laughs> it's not going to happen, folks. We are living in a time in America right now. This is, you know what the era this is? This is the scorched earth era. Okay. Right, Trump this... is burning the earth so that the new growth can come. Okay. He's going to burn out. All of this is going to be done. He's going to be out of office, and then there's going to be a new growth of prosperity there's gonna be a new growth of togetherness a new growth of understanding each other and realizing like racism there is no winner there's no winners in racism uh other countries are probably looking at us right now like yo they out of control man they they mm -hmm. destroying themselves and people always like to say like politicians well this is the greatest nation in the world it's not the greatest nation in the world if black don't like white if white don't like black if people don't if we if you hold any other people down in this country this, is, this can't be the greatest country in the world. There's always been the totem pole. There's always got to be a bottom for there to be a top. Right, there's right, a right, right, right. There's a perception that there's a top, but we're getting further and further and further. But you can't, that you can't, forcibly, you can't force people. You can't, first of all, you can't force people out of the totem pole. Yeah. You can't look at the totem pole and say, these people can't be on the totem pole. These, this, this color mm -hmm. can't be on the totem pole. Mm -hmm. Everybody has to be on the totem pole. Right. And everybody has to be aspiring in the totem pole. If you, where, wherever your order is, try to get to the top yeah but social media has turned that totem pole sideways yeah and now everybody feels like they're on the same level regardless of this is true what they know or this think or and whatever. then they start hating the person next to them not even realize that we're not going up we're going sideways all right that's an analogy all right so let's flip it into relationships you gotta you gotta yes. rewind that one because this man you know, well, what, what would you like to know well um you say that the slim pickings is hard in 2018, right? To find good mates, good good. Uh, I think so. No, first of all, I have a girlfriend, but I just think like for my single friends, like when I when I, I call my single friends, I'm like, hey man, me and wifey going out tonight. Get a girl. Let's go to the Knicks game, or you know, you got a girlfriend, bring her out. Let's go do something. When when I try to get my friends together for an outing, mm -hmm. I can tell that they have, they don't have a lot of choices, mm -hmm. and uh, you know. So certain guys want to be players. I said this. I think I said this Friday show. I didn't say it tonight or last night. But mm -hmm. the guys that are players are players because it, they, you know, they date a lot of women. They, mm -hmm. So they got ten girlfriends. It takes ten of those girls to add up to one quality woman. Mm -hmm. So a player is like it's a losing. It's not a. It's not a. Well, it's, it's, well, not a it's not how, an admirable. How, it's not an admirable space to, space to be in. But have things changed? Any? When did it start to change? I, I noticed a change in. The way black men treated black women around the, the really? 80s, I feel. How did they treat women differently in the 80s? I think not. I think, uh, well, quite frankly, I, I noticed a, dif a difference in the social conditioning of both men and women around the Eddie Murphy Raw specifically. Okay. When black, young black men start getting real money yeah. and the term skeezer came out, Right. Then you, you started seeing people that didn't mind being skeezers. But there was, there's that always been a term. Before, there was a term before skeezers. Gold diggers. There's huh? a term before thought. There's a what's, what's the term now? Well, yeah. Well, clear, clearly, even gold diggers comes yeah. from Dean so, Martin. But, but there's always been that. Yeah. Look how far back that goes. So there's mm -hmm. always going to be a percentage, a group of women that don't fit into the wife material. Mm -hmm. And don't mind not fitting into wife material. Okay. Like side chicks. Like side chicks is big now. Yeah. Some chicks don't mind being side chicks. Right. They just want the perks of the guy. They don't want the responsibility of the relationship. Right. And they happy with that. Yeah. And we, if you happy with it, good for you. Nothing wrong with it. But I but I notice, you know, I just think that um, the culture informs the way we right. treat one another. Right. Right. So when when I listen to the music, when I look at the videos, it's all out in the open, and it's. Promoted, you know. So I think there are the a lot music. of people that think they have to behave a certain way to be what what is representative of a man or a woman. I think I don't know if we have a coming of age anymore in terms of manhood. How do you how do you define? I think manhood? the music. I, I agree with you on that. The music definitely influences the uh, perception of mm -hmm. people. The music definitely uh, promotes what people uh, you know how they're gonna engage each other and I think that since the music is so bad now 
the reflection is in hoes and bitches and mm -hmm. drinking lean and mm -hmm. shooting niggas and there's not a lot of positive music out right. and it is reflected in the times right which makes it harder right so are we getting out of it what's what's your advice uh the my advice because because also monogamy becomes a problem too yeah you got to be see the, the, the thing is you have to in in just in life in general across the board you have to be a strong-willed person mm -hmm. you have to be focused and know who you are know what you are, know what you want, what you don't want, what you expect of your mate, and not settle for the bullshit. So the music is, fuck bitches, get money, da da da. You gotta be like, okay, it's music, I'm not gonna be a part of that. The drug era, everybody's getting high and simp sipping codeine. All right, I'm not gonna be, I'm bigger than that. My mother used to tell us when I, we were kids, and I will give you this one right here, this is some game for you. My mother used to tell us every morning before we left the house to go to school, you're better than everybody else. And we would always be like, what? That's kind of weird. You're better than everybody else. Mm -hmm. And when I was a kid, I remember like my friends like, yo, we getting high. I'm better than that, man. Yo, we going to break into a car or do that. I'm better than that. And I, I never smoked a joint a day in my life. I never smoked a cigarette. I never did no crazy. Like I was a bad kid mm -hmm. by certain standards. But I always remember like my mother's like, yo, you're better than that. And I remember I still like hold myself to that, to that standard. Like I don't get caught up in the book. I'm not robbing my own people. I'm not having babies out of wedlock and having baby mothers all over the place because I'm better than that. Mm -hmm. And I want my people to walk outside every day and think I'm better than that and you know, aspire to greatness and be better than what you see outside your door every day. Don't be a victim of, I live in the hood, people are acting this way, right. so fuck it, I gotta act this way too. No, be better than that. Well, proof we got the cameras to prove it. He's come a long way. <laughs> yes, my teeth are fixed. <laughs> Well, the top always, part. Always, all right, in. so before, I can't let you go because I don't know when we're going to get a chance again. So I, I, always, I know Rose Rock, a matter, yes. beautiful woman. Um, God bless you Shout for out having to Rose all Rock. these wonderful people in your family. I never, I never met your dad. I think he passed away maybe three or four months before um, I met you. Yes, yes. What can you say about Julius in terms Julius of Julius Rock Just was the man, there. man. Julius Rock was the greatest dude. Julius Rock taught us that you have to work for everything in life. There's no shortcuts. You, if, you, if, you, if you think you're going to take a shortcut, you're going to get cut short. My father worked 80 hours a week. He worked two full-time jobs. He uh, slept for like three or four hours, and then he went to one job. Then he came home and slept for like two hours and went to another job. Uh, he made sure his children had what he didn't have. Mm -hmm. uh, my, father is the, my father is the definition of a selfless guy. He put his children so far above him that I don't even think, my, I remember like we would go on vacation and my father couldn't come. And we would go to Disneyland and my father wouldn't come. And we would go to, you know, to the beach and he wouldn't come. Great adventure, he wouldn't come. But he made sure that we had everything in that, in that car or in that bus that we needed for the trip. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when we came, we came home, he wanted to hear everything about it, but he knew he had to work for his children. Yeah, great. So my dad is the guy that put, he's, he's just, he just taught and us so much about it. It just you know, made life. me think of a story, just to share with folks. He also broke the union. He was the first black My father person. is black history. Yes, I'm glad you brought that up. My father is black history. He was the first black man in the truck drivers union in New York City. I remember him getting death threats at the house, and I was too young to really understand what was going on because I remember my mother would answer the phone and start crying and hang up the phone. And, you know, I remember people knocking at the door and, like, boxes sent to the house, and she would open a box mm -hmm. and throw it in the garbage. And we didn't even understand what was going on. And wow. I remember councilmen coming to the house and, like, the the Brooklyn, uh, the Brooklyn uh, borough president coming to our house and mm -hmm. camera pe people coming to take photo ops. And I didn't understand what was going on. I just knew something. My dad was involved in something. And then when I saw that they named the street Rock Street in Bushwick, mm -hmm. where the brewery was, he worked at a brewery, he worked at Rangel Brewery. He was the first black man truck drivers union. And they named the street wow. where the brewery was, but not there anymore. But Rock Street still sits there. And it was in honor of my dad because he was the first black man in Truck Drivers Union. My dad has stitches across his back from shoulder to shoulder from when he was in the brewery and some, an accident happened and a keg of beers fell on him and cut his back open. Wow. And he had stitches across his back. And it was an accident and nobody knew how a keg of beers could fall on him, wow. fall on the one black man that was standing there. But my dad was the hardest working man I ever saw in my life. Okay, well, pressure makes diamonds. So. Yes, yes. So, yeah. well, thank you for spending. All right, okay. Appreciate you so much. Thank you, brother. All right, so ho hopefully we gave you something a little different. A little different. A little different you than know, pictures of me popping bottles on Instagram. But you need to write the dating book, 
And I think, um, yeah, it's not it's not about what you see every day. It's about the the people that you don't see. They're right, out working. Right. You have you to know. walk amongst the people. If you want to be a good comic, you got to walk amongst the people so you can write for the people from the people's perspective. Mm -hmm. That's why I don't have security. I don't have entourages keeping me away from people because I want to engage the people. I want to talk to them and hear what they have to say and see what they're going through, and okay. then I write for you. Yeah, so black people, you deserve to say you have an excellent day. Have an excellent day. And uh, thanks for watching. Right. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Appreciate you, man. My mother raised us, like... Mother, to believe you're better than everybody else. That way you don't do the same thing as everybody else. Kids, well, I'm the same as everybody else. Then you get high with everybody else. I always thought I was above that. Chris Rock. Chris Rock, you're high. You're rock.